Thank you, David. Our next speaker is Bruno Mambrini, who is founder and CEO at MetroHop. Bruno uh, is a board member of CAFE Foundation, and he was the event manager for the NASA Green Flight Challenge uh, in 2011. He's also, as I said, the founder of MetroHop. MetroHop uh, is a uh, East Ole Plain approach to the challenge of flying people and parcels quickly and affordably in greater metropolitan areas. At MIT, Bruno helped build the Chrysalis human-powered airplane. Over 100 people were able to fly that aircraft. And after college, Bruno founded AVEX Scientific, a surgical supply manufacturing company, which he recently sold to Stryker Instruments. Bruno's a fan of flow state, side projects, and making better stuff. Please welcome Bruno. MetroHop will transform the way we move within metropolitan areas. MetroHop is an all-electric, short takeoff and landing aircraft. It uses well-established aviation technology that provides a clear path to certification. The planes operate out of busy skyport stations that easily integrate into cityscapes around the globe. This trillion-dollar industry can operate on fares as low as $39, making it an accessible and inclusive method of travel for millions of people. The MetroHop plane is fast, flying at 250 miles per hour. In the San Francisco Bay Area, for example, it would take just under 10 minutes to travel from Embarcadero Center in San Francisco to San Jose International Airport in Santa Clara. The international patent-pending landing gear system allows the plane to take off and land in 60 meters. Powered wheels drive the plane to take off speed. Takeoff is fast and nearly silent. The plane is as quiet as an electric car, which means that it can fly subtly and peacefully overhead, day or night. The landing gear system allows the plane to land accurately and smoothly. As the plane flies over the landing marks, the motorized landing gear legs drive down to the ground. This is how MetroHop is able to land gently and reliably in most weather conditions. Using modern sensors, the MetroHop plane is aware of its environment and can react to an event before it becomes an incident. This is to ensure an unprecedented level of safety and comfort for all passengers. High passenger volume and efficiency within the Skyport stations, such as robotic battery swapping, keep fares low and profit margins high. A single station can handle 1,000 passengers per hour. In an urban area with 50 stations, this translates into 200 million passengers a year and $10 billion in revenue. This is not a tool for the elite, but a method to transform the way we all move within metropolitan areas. This future is within reach. Come join us on our journey to develop a practical and achievable path to urban air mobility. Hello everyone, I'm Bruno, and I'm glad you all made it here. I was part of the club that took a while to get here. I got to spend, I got to be an airport person in Dallas, a night airport person floating around the, the hallways of Dallas International. Um, anyway, this is our vision of uh, urban air mobility using a Stoll aircraft. And uh, Professor Dave is my new best friend. Um, more importantly than just a vision, this illustrates the elements that are needed uh, for a functional Stoll system. And um, today I'm going to tell you a little bit of how we got here, um, how we got to this design, a little bit about the landing gear. And finally, I'm going to share with you what I think is the first practical application of this design and how it will get us to where we can all fly around in uh, these machines. Uh, can you? OK. Yeah, that was supposed to. OK. So where do we start? The NASA Green Flight Challenge. Uh, as you know, I'm part of CAFE. And um, we had two electric planes that were the winners of uh, the NASA Green Flight Challenge. And uh, both of them got 400 miles per gallon per passenger. And the, Pipistre the Pipistrelle uh, won the event. But the uh, E-Genius had uh, two people in it. It also got 400 miles per gallon or nearly 400 miles per gallon, 
which means that this vehicle did 200 miles per gallon going at over 100 miles an hour. Uh, to give you a comparison, the year before, uh, XPRIZE put on a $10 million competition for the car that could be the most efficient. This thing did twice the efficiency going twice as fast. It was just absolutely incredible. Anyway, the reason I point out the eGenius is because the eGenius team is who is doing this project, the MetroHop project. So this project started out way back then after the, the Green Flight Challenge as an economic study to see if metropolitan air taxi uh, service could be viable. We didn't have the term urban air mobility back then. And so could it compete against limousines? Could it compete against taxis? Who would use it? And we already knew that if it was going to operate in cities over densely populated areas, the biggest challenge would be community acceptance. And I don't mean about people getting in the plane. I mean people underneath the plane, people in the cities themselves. And for that, the aircraft had to be safe, quiet, and very, very affordable. Um, the first thing that had to go was the pilot. And so for safety, economic, and practical reasons, some of the things we've already covered here today, there was no way that there could be a pilot on board. I mean, it took me months to get used to that idea because I was back then now with autonomy, autonomous cars and all, it's probably a little bit easier to accept. But I felt a little better when I knew we could have expert pilots and co-pilots and flight engineers and medical safe staff and so on on the ground in mission control with a direct TV link to a monitor in the plane. And as far as costs go, once the crew is out of the cockpit, the cost is really not an issue. Um, Furthermore, all the artificial intelligence and deep learning is great and necessary for autonomous, but computers have no common sense, no empathy, and no authority over most people. And in a bad situation, you want somebody with, that has empathy and has authority and uh, common sense. It's, it's a really critical time for that. So we took the crew out of the aircraft, and then we figured out a really brilliant concept. Um, I believe the technical term is high utilization. Uh, the cost of the aircraft, even the cost of the skyports, is not the driving force. Uh, the question becomes, in an urban air mobility system, what are the elements of high utilization? Um, so first we look at the, at the skyport, because that's really the bottleneck in the system. And the key in an urban environment where space is at a premium is to maximize the number of people coming and going every hour. It turns out that, so the DAR, departure and arrival rate, times the turnaround transit time equals the Skyport station size. And we call that the Skyport rule. So let's look at the departure and arrival rate, the first, the first unit. So we, get six, we can do six planes in and six planes out. And to do that, um, so to get a lot of planes in and out, the planes have to come in fast and leave fast. And so we can do that with two airstrips, a meteorized a synchronized pattern uh, with a right and left uh, pattern. And we can get planes in, uh, two in or six planes, in and out every minute and maintain a 750 meter separation. Uh, next, we look at the turnaround transit time. So we want to minimize the turnaround transit time. We can get it to three minutes. We did studies. We could get it from two minutes, 20 seconds to seven minutes. And the average was, was three minutes. And the way we do that is with the robotic battery swapping. Um, uh, OK, to further minimize the time to, to board the plane, we have sheltered curbside loading and unloading. Uh, the metro planes can rapid taxi. So rapid taxi means that when the plane is taxiing, it can actually lean through the turn. So we can actually maintain a higher speed as, as we're taxiing. And so this gave us 18 planes. The, the, the size of the Skyport it has to accommodate 18 planes and also 1,000 passengers an hour. Um, Okay, and we did this with the, as you saw in the video, there's the two level space that's 300 feet by 300 feet with the two effective usable airstrips. And they, what's not clear in the video is that the planes always land and take off into the wind. That's a, a critical requirement. 
Um, the conclusion of the Skyport rule is that the size, the, the S cube, the, the size of the Skyport station is determined by the activity it can handle and not the size of the landing space. Uh, okay, finally, the final element of high utilization is cruise speed. So the size of an urban air mobility fleet is determined by the demand during peak periods. It, it may not matter much to the average passenger if it gets there in 10 minutes or gets there in, in about 15 minutes, but to the operator, that's about 50% more planes he needs. So the faster the planes are, the fewer planes are needed. Okay, I think we're done talking about high utilization, and now let's talk about the landing gear. So, in the way we're doing it, propellers cannot drive a plane. In, uh, uh, propellers cannot drive a plane to takeoff speed in 200 feet. So we use a Formula One drag tire, or Formula One tire, to drive the plane to takeoff speed. Um, the, the problem is that the rear wheel is is further back than you would normally find on a plane to prevent wheelies, prevent the, the plane from tipping back. And so what do we do to rotate? We, that would prevent us from rotate. So we use the active landing gear, the front legs of the active landing gear, to actually push the nose up. The plane doesn't hop off the ground. It just, we just push the nose up to force rotation. OK. No, so landing has two issues. Not only do you have to land in the 60 meters at 200 feet, but you have to hit the landing marks within plus or minus 15 feet. And we can't slam into the deck like on an aircraft carrier. So what do we do? Well, we aim for an area that we can handle, a, a, imagine a virtual box over the landing marks. Now, we're trying to maintain a very steady deceleration. We're, not tr we're being very careful not to jerk the, uh, the uh, passenger. We're coming in fast. We're coming in at over 50 miles an hour. So how are we going to, to be able to, to do all those things at once and hit the landing marks? Well, we can't. We can't really control that. But in the front landing gear, in the active landing gear, we have sensors. And we can very, very, measure, very, very accurately measure the distance to the ground. And when we get over the landing marks, we drive the landing gear to the ground, exactly to the right distance that we need to be. So, and again, in the air, we're getting, we start deceleration in the air, so the passenger is in a seat belt, and then as he lands, the, the, what happens is as soon as the wheels touch, we spoil the wing, so all the way goes directly to the wheels. So now the wheels can take over the deceleration. We have brakes on the wheels, to take over the deceleration, and we maintain a very steady and smooth deceleration as we're landing. The final element of this is that as, as sir, the, the plane has landed, now we, have, we don't have shock absorbers now. So what we do is as the, land is, the plane is falling, we are dissipating that energy into, with a brake. So we're, we're doing a very controlled landing as it comes down and dissipating that energy with brakes which are very, very efficient at dissipating energy. Anyway, so that's how we can assure gentle and smooth landings, secure landings, and very repeatedly with good confidence. Okay. So where are we now? So we're, right now we're seeking funds to build two full-size demonstrator planes. The problem is, once we have these planes, what are we going to do? Uh, rules and regulations do not exist for robotic planes. Autonomous air traffic control does not exist. Quite a few of things you saw in the video do not exist. And most of all, the rules and regulations to certific certificate these systems, although people are working on them, still do not exist. So it turns out that the mission for transporting packages around metropolitan areas by air is very similar to the passenger transport mission. The one big difference is that we can use piloted planes to start. Uh, the destinations are from outlying mega warehouses, the fulfillment centers, to close in edge of city distribution center. As my friend Mark Osman calls it, warehouse to warehouse. And the key to urban air cargo transport for warehouse to warehouse is the same. It's high utilization. 
So e-commerce continues to accelerate. People quickly got used to the idea of two-day delivery, and now we, we even have one-day delivery. And uh, the expectation is that soon we'll have same-day delivery. And yes, we've seen some of this in some parts of the world, but as a rule, ground transportation systems just will not be able to handle this kind of traffic and demand in congested metropolitan areas. So to start, Metro Hop Cargo wants to address a specific segment of the warehouse to warehouse market. Here's a map of surgical hospitals and surgery centers in a 100 mile radius from San Francisco. The fulfillment centers are warehouses that are near the edge actually of the, of the, of the distance here in Sacramento, down south in uh, the Modesto. There's actually some in San Jose and even in Fremont. But for the most part, the fulfillment centers are out in the outer bounds of the, of the, of the area. So for many healthcare facilities, the supply chain accounts for 40% of their expenses. A typical medical center catalogs as many items, materials, and supplies as a supermarket. In many cases, close to 50,000 barcode SKUs. The, the medical centers tend to be located in congested urban areas where space is at a premium and storage is limited. The nature of health care makes it difficult and often not possible to anticipate what supplies will be needed well ahead of time. Therefore, the shipping cost to health care facilities is overwhelmingly dominated by expensive express delivery. This is a perfect market for Metro Hop Cargo. Packages are small, expensive, and, requ and are required on a short notice. In this area, Metro Hop can fly from the medical fulfillment warehouses to existing close-in airports and airfields and a few distribution warehouse skyports. Namely, one, we really need one skyport in near San Francisco. 40% of the medical healthcare market in this area is concentrated in San Francisco. Um, Stanford Hospital and, and uh, Lucille Packard, the Children's Hospital, one parking lot. That's an $18 billion business in one place. Okay, so here's our piloted aircraft with uh, Thing 1 and Thing 2, uh, the cargo bin swapping robot. Uh, the average turnaround time in, at an airfield is estimated at seven minutes. Uh, the bin swap takes less than a minute. The payload is 175 cubic feet, five cubic meters, and about 1,000 pounds, and the range is 125 miles. Uh, the cargo compartment is actually made up of two half shells, a left bin and a right bin. For hospital supplies, each half shell or bin holds about 150 parcels. Um, this is a match to compact city vans, the, the vehicle of choice for urban deliveries. So when loaded for delivery, city vans hold about 150 parcels. One Metro Hop cargo plane, therefore, can supply two delivery vans. Um, what is really nice about this setup is that we can offer same-day service at half the price of overnight. So this is how we start our journey to affordable urban air mobility for everyone. With parcel delivery, we can begin building the infrastructure and implement the new rules and systems that will be needed for passenger transport. Okay. It's supposed to be a blue slide, but anyway. I will share with you one of the reasons why this is important to me. Um, in my past life, I was involved with developing medical equipment one project I worked on uh, was with uh, UCSF Medical Center in San Francisco. One of the patients was a, this wonderfully little eight-year-old girl named Sally. She was, everyone loved her. She was a really bright kid, really spirited, a real bright kid. She lived way out there in the valley in, in Turlock. It's, it's way out. She was in a wheelchair and once a month she had to come to see her doctors. Traffic coming in from there and coming into San Francisco is horrible in the morning. Plus they had to stop a couple of times along the way. It, really not an easy trip. Her mom Rosa had to get her up at four o'clock in the morning to make their 10 o'clock appointment. It turns out that Turlock way out there is 22 minutes away by airplane. Thank you. And I'll take questions when we do the, the, uh, the questions together.